The angel of the Lord said to Joseph, Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So first, I'm going to read this gospel again, this time with the three omitted verses that actually generate the power and the message of the passage. It's not for tender ears to hear, not your typical Sunday morning fare, so we're going to get into it, of course. Then I will describe how the structure of this passage anticipates the, la the, the last part of Matthew's narrative in the passion itself. Then the theological beef will come next as this morning's gospel proclaims a defiant hope into the real world in which we live. And finally, we'll explore what the disciplines of that hope might be. So first, let's read the gospel with all the verses in it, shall we? And it starts again at verse 13. Now, after the wise men had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah, a voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in, in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of e Israel, for those who are seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. So there's this part about the slaughter of the holy innocents, as the church calls them. And we're going to get to what that means for us today. But first, this is the part where I try to make Bible scholars out of all of you. And to demonstrate, to show you how Matthew's narrative, the way that he begins the narrative with the infancy stories, syncs up or in a sense anticipates this narrative of his passion, the way that he ends his story. So... You begin in both, in both senses, both the nativity and in Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on what we will call Palm Sunday. You have a dramatic entry into the human scene, right? In a sense, when Jesus comes into Jerusalem, it is the presence of the true messianic king is proclaimed with all the palms, you know, you know Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. God's son, the son of David, God's own Messiah had arrived. And we know in Matthew's, in, as he begins his nativity story, how God is now with us, Emmanuel, in this Jesus. So entry into the human scene, followed by rejection and murderous intent. Right? A murderous rejection of this Messiah. In the nativity story, it's with the slaughter of the holy innocents. But we know at the passion that this is a bullet that Jesus would not dodge a second time. Ultimately, what had happened to his kinfolk, to the children of his kin in Bethlehem, ultimately would fall upon himself. Herod is involved in both of these murders. Then there is a withdrawal to Egypt. 
a flight in the face of rejection and murderous attempt, uh, intent to Egypt. And in the biblical worldview, in the Old Testament narrative, Egypt is the symbol of slavery and death. Right? It is land of slavery and death out of which God calls his son, Israel, calls his people into the promise of new and eternal life in which he will dwell in their midst. And in his death, Jesus withdraws into the Egypt of the tomb. He withdraws from the human scene into death itself. We confess in the creed, he descended to the dead, or in the old right one language, he descended to hell, has far away from God and God's love as one could possibly get. He withdraws to this place. This withdrawal is then followed by a victorious return to new life. Right? So Herod dies, and Joseph is told, come back to Israel. It's time to come back. The threat is over. Those who seek the child's life are gone. They're powerless against him. So Joseph and Mary and the infant Jesus come back. And similarly, Jesus bursts forth from the tomb to be once again in Israel. But following that, there is a prompt going forth to Galilee, right? And since they're going to come into Israel, and then they immediately go to Galilee. And in the theological geography of the Gospels, Galilee stands in a sense for the rest of the world. That the good news of God's victory over death begins in Israel, begins with is Israel as a people, and then moves out into the rest of the world to those Galilees, Galilee of the Gentiles, or as I like to say, Galilee of the mixed people, right? Galilee of all the mixed bag of people, which is the rest of the world, into which the good news is called to go. So in each of these stages of the journey of Matthew's narrative, kind of match up to the end of the story, the stages of the journey of Jesus through death and resurrection itself. Okay, so why spend this time outlining the narrative structure and the nativity and the passion? Precisely because the story of the flight to Egypt and the slaughter of the holy innocents speaks the paschal mystery, speaks Jesus' life out of death, his victory over all that would separate us from God lo God's love. It speaks this paschal mystery of the great three days, crucifixion to resurrection, into the real world in which we ourselves live a world of seemingly unchecked, violent evil and inconsolable suffering. In a sense, I think Matthew begins his gospel story this way. He includes this episode of Jesus' life in order to tell us that the good news of Jesus' victory of life is that it doesn't come to a place that we don't know. It comes into the world that we do know precisely in the seeming victory of evil over what is good. The seeming victory of violence over love the depth of sorrow and grief in which so many of us live, inconsolable suffering. This is the world in which Jesus Messiah is born. And it is the world in which we live so that we know that Jesus comes into our world as well with the good news of his victory. Matthew's description of the world into which the Messiah is born and in which the church, meaning us, in which the church lives, is unflinching and totally devoid of sentiment. Maybe this is why they take it out of the lectionary, because after all, it, it was, it's Christmas season still. We're still, you know, Jesus, meek and mild, little baby, so cute. And I just did a sermon about that like seven days ago, right? This tiny baby Jesus. We're still trying to grapple with that we haven't even taken down some of us haven't even taken out the trees yet right all this stuff is up all this family and joy and sentiment is still the waters in which we move and have our being at this point but matthew's matthew's narrative is like a 
pail of cold water being thrown on all of that. It is totally without sentiment. The killing of Bethlehem's children is not some random act of violence or one-off. It is quintessentially state-sponsored destruction of children and is no different in kind from carpet bombing cities or civilians. It is reported in a matter-of-fact way and despite Herod's murderous rage is executed with scientific precision. After all, the children who are two year years old or younger, basically Herod is tracking how long would a journey from the east where these guys came from be, and I want to be thorough. But no more than that. I don't want you to kill all of them, of course. We want this to be a surgical strike on Bethlehem in which we only take the children that are a threat to us. It occurs to me that they had stars, but we have coordinates. The prophetic text is given to us in the passive voice, the prophetic text that Matthew cites here from Jeremiah. Would it be interesting to you to know that this passage about the voice of lamentation and Ramach and Rachel weeping inconsolably for her children are the very next verses after this Sunday's Old Testament lesson that we just read? Yes. So you see, God through the prophet Jeremiah describes the victory. He describes ultimately what he will bring about in his goodness and love and his mercy. But then he goes on to say, by the way, I know what's going on right now. Right now, this is where you live. You live in a place of lamentation, a place of grief, an inconsolable rage at the injustices that are put upon you. And so this prophetic text that Matthew gives in this part is phrased in the passive voice. That is to say, in the rest, in your service leaflet, it has twice where it will say, this happened in order to fulfill what the prophet said. That is, God's direct, in a sense, guidance is occurring in accordance with his word. But in this passage, it's different. It's a, it's a one-off. Here... Matthew simply says, then was fulfilled. Right? It's not that God is directing this. It's simply, I think, in order to say, it's as if Matthew is saying, God told you this sort of thing would happen. In a world that lives apart from God's love, in a world based in which power is based on violence and domination of others, this is the sort of thing you get, right? Lamentation, inconsolable grief. It's as if Matthew is saying, see, your world actually needs this Messiah. You're in a horrible state. This is the sort of thing that needs redemption, that needs to be put to rights. Matthew's infancy narrative also places Emmanuel, God with us in Jesus, has a witness, a witness to violent hate and innocent suffering. When we read this narrative, it's almost as if we can hear the hoofbeats of Herod's horses just behind the shuffling steps of Mary's donkey. This is not something happening apart from Jesus. This is something to which Jesus is a witness. God is there when innocents suffer. He witnesses it. It is not something happening outside his view. It's interesting to me that the psalm, when it des the psalms describe the perspective of the wicked, it, they say, the wicked says in his heart, God does not notice, neither does he know. The wicked like to imagine that they get to do their things outside of God's awareness. But Matthew's story tells us that Emmanuel was there when the children were slain. I think Matthew is saying in this quote from Jeremiah that Rachel is not the only one weeping, is she? That God sees. That God weeps. 
that God refuses to be consoled. God refuses to accept this situation. God refuses to be told that it will all be okay and work out in the end. God refuses to allow this to stand. Matthew's narrative repeats the truth spoken in Psalm 116, verse 15, that says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his people. Precious in his sight are the death of his little ones. When something is precious to you, it means you go back and you get it if it's lost, right? If it's precious, it means you retrieve it. I mean, for Pete's sake, when I forget my ring in the gym because, you know, I take it off and I realize two hours later, I'm like, what's it? Oh, gosh, and I drive right over to the gym and go try to fetch it immediately, right? And it's a wedding ring. This is people, and it's God, right? Precious in his sight means that God will do whatever is necessary to bring his people home, even out of death. He sees, he is inconsolable, and he saves. This is the good news of Matthew's narrative. God acted is acting and will act in Jesus against death and all the Herods that are its human accomplices. But in the midst of this good news, Matthew will not allow us to be naive. Herod is no fool. He is not someone to be taken lightly or accepted as an ephemeral and unfortunately necessary stage in historical human development. Like, they were so primitive back then that they did horrible things. We, of course, don't kill children in our time and place. Sure, sometimes the enemies of the kingdom of God's love unwittingly or unwillingly help the kingdom spread. After all, Herod and the temple authorities did actually point the wise men in the right direction, right? They didn't find Bethlehem on their own. They had to stop and ask for directions. And so Herod and his crew, in a sense, unwittingly, unwillingly gave the directions to the good news to the wise men who could go forth in joy to their own people. So yes, sometimes the enemies of the kingdom of God's love unwittingly or unwillingly help the kingdom spread. But if you'll pardon my language and put the ears over, or your hands over the ears of your children, frankly, most of the time, they're just murderous bastards who kill because they can or because the logic of their power both creates and then demands the need for further violence. Isaac Asimov said, violence is the last refuge of the incompetent. I beg to differ. There was absolutely nothing incompetent about what happened in Bethlehem that night when Herod's soldiers arrived. I say violence is the first refuge of the damned, of those without a future. Thus, Jesus is born into a world in which children, children, The ultimate symbol both of fragility and of the future. Isn't that something how children are both one at the same time? The symbol of fragility and of the future. Of life's perduring possibilities. Jesus is born into a world in which children are killed by those who wish to foreclose the future. So that they can continue to wield power over others based on fear on the dark lie that there is no future, only the present which they themselves control. This is a dark lie to which the followers of Jesus are held up to be a light, like a star against an inky eastern sky just before a brilliant sun is about to dawn. The story also tells us, Matthew's story also tells us something that Episcopalians typically are too polite to say, but is good news to those who face injustice, those who find themselves under the thumb of the Herods of this world. Matthew's story makes absolutely clear that Herods die. 
Herod's die. In fact, he says it several times in just in this brief little narrative. Herod dies. And all the sons and daughters of God, all of his children will be called out of their Egypts, out of all the tombs into which the Herods and Caiaphases and Caesars and Pharaohs of this world would attempt to confine and enslave us. We are to be called out of those deaths into new and glorious life. That's the good news of Matthew's nativity story. I said I would close with the disciplines of hope. One of the disciplines of hope is to believe. We have one of the young ones of Bethlehem. He speak, I think he's responding to the sermon right now. <laughs> leave him unharmed. That's the whole point of the sermon is leave him unharmed. What are these disciplines of hope? The first and perhaps most underrated one is something we do every morning just after the sermon. We stand and we face that cross and we reckon with suffering. We reckon with death. We reckon with all the powers of this world and the cruelty they can inflict. And what do we say? What are the first words out of our mouth? I trust in God. I trust in God. Do not underestimate the power of this defiant hope. In the face of all the darkness of this world, all the power that Herod can wield, we dare to say, I believe in God, the maker of heaven and earth. He is in charge. His is the victory. I trust in God. That is a discipline of hope. That is a discipline of hope. Never underestimate the subversive nature of what you do in here. Don't underestimate it. The second discipline of hope is to come forward and to receive in your hands the meal of the resurrection, the bread of Jesus' risen victory over death. Why? Because the resurrection, the power of that new life contained in that sacrament, officially delimits the powers of death. The resurrection of Jesus displays just how powerless violence and evil is. The resurrection of Jesus says, death, you can come this far, but not an inch farther. Because precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Receive the power of that resurrection that shows what a lie death and hatred and fear are in the world. And the third discipline is a gentle one. It's one that we often don't do enough of perhaps because we're just so darn busy avoiding the Herods of this life, and that is celebration, celebrating life. I came to this reading the works of Jean Vanier, the founder of the large community who built a whole community out of pairs of you know, what we would call able-bodied persons and those who are severely or even catastrophically handicapped mentally or physically, and they work as pairs, each one teaching the other how to give and receive love. And Jean Vanier says that at the heart of their community, which in many ways, the life there is so difficult, right? The suffering there is very real. But what sustains them, the heart of what sustains them is celebration. He says, when someone can hold the sp a spoon in their hand for the first time, that deserves a cake, right? Celebration. So underrated, so overlooked, celebrating life with each other, celebrating small victories of life over death. Celebration is a discipline of hope. And when we celebrate, what often do you sing, even in the birthday party? What do you sing? Happy birthday. I can't go any further because they're like trademarks, I guess, right? But we sing, don't we? When you celebrate, if you're truly celebrating, you're singing. And I would posit song 
as the last and great discipline of hope to sing, to dare to sing in the nighttime in which we live with Herod's run amok, to sing in that nighttime of the day that is coming in Jesus, to sing of the day that is already here in the love that we share with each other. Sing, beloved, sing your defiant hope into that night. Sing your faith. Sing your hope. And know, and know that God has, is now, and will bring you out of Egypt. Amen.